Thank you, Lev. Um, I'm very honored and very pleased to be here. I only came to Cleveland four and a half months ago, and I've been uh, delighted by the richness of the environment here, both academically and artistically. Um, and one of the objectives we have in, in building this new department is to try to bring together many of the different uh, resources around the University Circle area. So this is a, a wonderful opportunity for us to get to know one another and, and start laying out some of the groundwork. What I'm going to do here today is to give you a very broad perspective on human beings and the history of art itself in the context of a very long period of time. Most of us are thinking, are used to thinking in terms of, our, of, of days or weeks or decades or centuries, but I'm going to be talking in terms of hundreds of thousands of years um, and, and look in the deep history, the deep prehistory of human beings and what that might tell us about where art came from, what it is, and, and, uh, and then that will throw the current technological revolution, and I think it is truly a revolution, in, in context and allow us to look at it a little differently. <clears throat> and in the process, I hope that I can show you um, that human culture and the human mind are, are they co-evolve together so that when a child grows up in our society, that child is, is learning much more than you think it learns because society retains, it has a, a deep memory and it retains things that, that emerged perhaps hundreds of thousands of years ago, as well as things that came out yesterday. So to some degree in, in, in cognitive science, we're trying to unscramble the eggs and trying to figure out the, the underlying structures that are driving this whole uh, effort uh, uh, that we see in art. Now, um, I have to get used to this technology here. I'm, a, <clears throat> I'm, I'm an old guy and technology is, is moving faster than my brain, it seems. Um, the, uh, I want to start off with a comment on imagination. Now, this image appeared in Time magazine some 25 years ago, and it's, it's an amusing image to me. And uh, it's a, uh, a welcoming reception for a group of engineering students at the University of Ottawa. Right? So uh, you, can, you can look at this, and you can see what is about to happen. Right? Uh, and uh, it's a wonderful shot, because they're totally innocent. They have no idea what's happening. <laughs> and up above you have these people who, now, in your mind, you have no difficulty projecting the future when you look at this, right? This is, so you know <clears throat> exactly what's gonna happen. The people on the roof are gonna be lying on the ground, laughing, rolling around. The people on the bottom, well, if you put yourself in the position of the fellow in the far right, you know that his hair is going to part in the middle and that he's going to taste the water pouring down over his upper lip and that his, you know, it's all right. You can, you can zoom in and imagine all sorts of different scenarios. You can also uh, imagine perhaps uh, less uh, uh, optimistic scenarios, but, but the point is that you can imagine. Now, if you show this picture to any other creature than a human being, it's, it's just going to stare at it and it won't, it, won't, it won't seem to mean very much, but we have this amazing imagination that is able to not only predict the future, as it does in this case, but to construct very improbable and likely futures, that is to say, um, we have this remarkable ability to, to create virtual worlds. And of course, artists, uh, this is a, a Schlichter uh, painting from 1922, <clears throat> have, in the, especially in the 20th century, started moving into the creation of worlds that were very improbable indeed. Of course, one could say this was already happening five or 600 years earlier. But uh, within that painting, you have uh, all comments on all sorts of things having to do with uh, embodiment, with femininity, with all sorts of things. Um, and, and it's a very rich environment, and it's entirely a product of the imagination. So the question is, where did this come from? Uh, because it's uniquely human. It's something that we just don't see anywhere else. Well, in fact, in our deep history, we're primates. We're, we're not like whales. Our brains are very different. Whales are very intelligent, and so are dolphins, but their brains are totally different. And birds, some of them are very bright, but their brains are totally different. They don't have a cortex, this great big structure that we have. And there are, uh, we're not like uh, lions and tigers or dogs and wolves. We're primates, but we're remarkably like primates, and our brain structure is still that of a primate, even though it's much larger, as you can see here, about three times larger than the brain of our closest relative, uh, which is a chimpanzee. 
Now, one of the things, if we just want to think about chimpanzees for a minute, is that they're very smart. They're social creatures. Here's a group of bonobos. This is a picture of, uh, belongs to Franz de Waal, who's a, a very famous man who uh, heads the Primate Institute in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and, and Franz studies these groups, and, and you can see that uh, these are social creatures that hang around together in groups, and they can understand very complicated things like changing political alliances, the dominant male in, in among uh, uh, chimps of various kinds is usually one who forms bigger gangs, bigger alliances than others, not necessarily the biggest, strongest male. And uh, there's a, a woman sitting in the middle, and in, in her mind, we know that she has a representation, as shown in that outline thing, of the scene with all of the different players in the scene. And within her mind, she can move around in that scene, and she can single out uh, individual events in that scene and, and choose, in a way, to move around in her mental representation. But the important thing is she lives in her imagination, and we all do. We carry around in our minds only that part of the external world that's, that is our own, that we have represented in our imagination. So in effect, we all live in a virtual world all the time. And, and you could say, well, so what's new about virtual worlds? They're not really that new. We've always lived in virtual worlds. Um, to get that way, I've argued that human beings about two million years ago had a revolution, oddly enough, in the control of movement. And the, the basis of all of human culture, including art, is I think in a revolution that I call mimetic culture. Mimetic culture is something that um, is the culture of an actor. We become actors in a, in a, in a social scene that's like theater in, in, in many ways. And human beings at that time were, um, uh, the, the creature was called Homo erectus, erect man, uh, reached about, uh, the brain reached about 70% of its modern uh, capacity, and they started manufacturing tools of increasing complexity. And so we know that back in that period, when they started with very simple tools, they moved to much more complicated tools. So we knew that they could communicate by imitating one another. We also knew that they could uh, construct uh, skills, uh, refine skills, practice things and rehearse them over and over again. And uh, about 15 or 20 years ago, and I was first thinking about this, it, it occurred to me that that kind of representation is exactly what performance art is about, about uh, the performance of a singer or an actor or uh, for that matter, an athlete uh, is, is wrapped up in that ability. And human children are very unique and very different from, let's say, uh, apes in that sense. They play with their body expression. Uh, a child may spend an afternoon standing on one foot, just learning to stand on one foot because her brother stands on one foot or something like that. But we just enjoy doing things that are, uh, in some cases, odd with our bodies because we're naturally embodied creatures. And uh, that capacity is absent in every other species I know. You'll never see, uh, for example, uh, baboons throw stones at one another when they have wars. But you'll never see a baboon in the forest all afternoon standing there practicing throwing stones and getting better at it. Okay? This is something we do. And the result is skill. We have um, thousands and thousands of skills that we acquire during our lives. And in order to acquire those things, we use our imagination. We imagine uh, uh, an action, and we can then carry it out. So a very good athlete, uh, which I am not, uh, can actually carry out a complex uh, dive. My intention might be to do a two and a half gainer, but in fact, I'll do a be belly flop every time. But there are people up there who can imagine all of the movements, carry them out, review their performance, go back, and keep improving it, improving it, improving it. And this is true in many different dimensions, so that we are capable as creatures of refining action. And you can see that in things like tool making, the mastery of fire, some of the things that we were doing in those days. Um, and this itself is a very remarkable thing. It's, and we, we, many people today are convinced that it's related to a very important hot new topic in the study of the brain, which is the mirror neuron system, the mirror neuron systems of the brain. Are, are systems that allow you uh, to take a third party look at your own action. It was discovered by a, a, an eminent Italian physiologist named Rizzolatti about seven or eight years ago. And he noticed he was studying the motor ne neurons in the premotor cortex of the monkey. And, he note, and one of the actions that he was coding was picking up a coffee cup so that the neuron would only fire when the coffee cup was picked up. 
If the monkey just made a movement like this, that wouldn't do it. If the monkey just looked at the coffee cup, that wouldn't do it. If the monkey picked up the coffee cup, that particular neuron would fire. What he had found out by accident was that if he demonstrated the action to the monkey with his own hand from a third party point of view, the same neuron would fire. In other words, this neuron would regard it an equivalence between what he was doing and what the monkey himself was doing. So that it, 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 was, it took two perspectives on the same action. So that mirror neuron system uh, is present in primates. It gets more rich in, in uh, apes and it's extremely rich in human beings and that quite possibly is the basis for, for this ability. Um, and one of the things that we do when we do things like dancing and so on is that we map that system onto a representation of the wider world. This is a very complex problem physiologically, but uh, there's a great deal of work being done in, in this area, and uh, we're starting to understand more and more about how it came about that we're so good at manipulating our bodies. The, the result of this is that we're, we're all performance actors. There's an element of drama, an element of dance, an element of gesture in our interactions, which is uh, fundamental to human nature. Um, and one of the results of this is that in human culture, one of the things we do is use our bodies to control one another's attention. Um, this is a basic dimension of human nature. And if you look at this mother and this infant interacting, and the mother, of course, makes a face and the infant makes a face back. An experiment, a very revealing experiment, was done about 20 years ago on this, in which it was shown that if you just tape recorded the mother's face and showed it to the infant, the infant would lose interest the infant has to live under the delusion that he or she is controlling the mother's expression. <laughs> Just watching the tape of the very same expressions doesn't do it. There has this second by second, back and forth, reciprocal control over one another's attention. It's fundamental to human nature. And as a result, we have all of these expressions all around the world uh, that acknowledge the, the presence of the other. For example, in greetings, we can uh, we, in, in a sense, measure the social distance between people by the way they greet one another, and different cultures do it differently, but in essence, uh, that's another example of this reciprocal attention. It, it sometimes uh, is reflected in, in reciprocal stances. This is a very democratic situation where the two people are assuming the same stance. If you're a king and you're dealing with the peasants, of course, you don't do this. You sit up high on your throne and the peasant is groveling down below, uh, cap in hand. But the, these uh, ways of greeting, ways of looking at people, ways of, of acknowledging authority or intimacy are fundamental to human culture. And that's part of mimetic culture. Uh, gaze is another aspect of it. We use our eyes to track relationships and we're very good at tracking many different relationships just by the way people look at one another. Um, and there are games that come out of this. This is a game in which the child is not supposed to laugh. Of course, the child always breaks down and giggles after a few seconds, but the idea is you stare at one another and you don't laugh. What other creature would do that but a human being? You, know, you, don't, see, you don't see two bonobos staring at one another and, and breaking up. In fact, in most animals, if they stare at one another, it's considered a challenge. You either submit or you attack, you know? Uh, and so children start reciprocating with their own little gestures and as they get, even as long as nine months, they, they can understand some elementary ones and, uh, and reciprocate. And this results in formal gestural systems and expressive systems that appear in, on the stage and, and in, uh, in, in uh, various forms of communication. Now, mimetic expression can actually make a group uh, quite coherent. Uh, if there were a fire in this theater and I didn't speak the language of the audience, I could nevertheless clear the, clear the theater very quickly, mimetically, just by gesticulation and sound. It's a very powerful means of communication. And my hypothesis was, at the time, that um, about two million years ago, when people started to move in this direction, this was the adaptation that did it. They didn't have language yet. This, was, this, is, this is really basic stuff. And it's reflected in the way we, we live today. This is a carnival. This is also a carnival. I mean, the reality is that uh, analytic, uh, scientific, uh, symbolic explanations don't work too well for this kind of behavior. It's very irrational, very emotional. And the mimetic dimension is we all tend to conform to the group pattern. It's very difficult to resist that power of the group. And the result is a creative culture that generates all kinds of skills, including artistic skills, 
and allows us to do things that no other species can do. And I look upon this mimetic dimension of culture as the, as the, the basic la layer to which everything else refers. So although this evolved, started to evolve two million years ago, it's still around today and it's still fundamental. And all you have to do is look at pop culture to understand that. You can see that in things like rock videos and so on, in, in advertising, in political campaigns, it's all mimetic. It's all about the gesture, the body style, the actor. Well, somewhere along the line, most of us think about 200,000 years ago, we started to move towards speech and language. And that involves a whole new structure which is added on top of this. Okay, so in your, in your brain, you're talking now about a new structure, but in the society, you're also thinking of a whole new set of cultural representations. And I've summed that up by calling it mythic culture because it's about storytelling. And stories are ways of, uh, very efficient ways of organizing your knowledge in, in your mind and uh, communicating very complicated things. Now, imagination is enriched by language, so I'll just read a little poem here by Wallace Stevens, and it's, a, it's, it's very interesting to me because it shows you how your, your imagination of yourself can be affected by language. No matter, the grass is full and full of yourself, the trees around you are for you, the whole of the wideness of night is for you, a self that touches all edges, you become a self that fills the four corners of the night. And you can just feel yourself sort of expanding into this uh, void and, and your physical presence somehow uh, is, is imagined in, in a very large way. And it's all driven by language. And yet underneath it all, there's a mimetic representation, the, the sense of your own embodiment driving it. Um, with language uh, and with what was called the symbolic explosion about 40,000 years ago, we suddenly start to see what we now recognize as art. That is to say, uh, these, are, these are paintings about 20,000 years old in, in Lascaux, um, and they are, uh, they're very sophisticated. I mean, they're enormously advanced. Within a few thousand years, human beings uh, in various parts of the world uh, were producing uh, works of art that really, um, in, in my view, rival a lot of things that are still produced today. Um, and most of the art was in places that was uh, very hard to access. So it is thought that most, most of that art, at least the art that survived, was of, of a religious nature, that individuals went in deep into caves that were very dark. They had to have oil lamps. They had to have all kinds of technology to get in there. In some cases, they had to swim underwater at Neo, for example, for some distance to get into the cave where they would be confronted with these amazing images, and uh, undoubtedly it was involved in a ritualistic type of setting. There are uh, settings of that sort right here in Ohio. The Serpent Mound is a very remarkable structure, which is a burial ground, very similar to the Long Barrows in the British Isles, and in which there are graves, and, and uh, undoubtedly a very important people, so that you can think of, of this kind of a culture, uh, a mythic culture, as one that has beliefs, usually in an afterlife, uh, very complex rituals of respect for the dead, and a whole variety of, of uh, ideas and stories about the past. Now within that context, uh, you have paintings that, that show images that are really mimetic in many ways. So this is a, a tomb from Egypt uh, about uh, 3,500 years ago in which uh, a pharaoh's journey into the, uh, the, never, the netherworld is, is mapped out. And all of these symbols are astrological symbols and various gods and interveners that are guiding the soul through its passage in various stages. And you continue this and you look through classic culture and you find that every culture has its mythic structure, its stories, its, its, its legends, and myth is so deep that you're not even aware of it. If you, in, in Bourges in the 13th century, you have this building which contains within it all of the major ideas of Western civilization in one place. So that you have, uh, when you go into it, you have an experience of imagery, of stories, of words, of uh, symbols of all kinds, including rituals, which sums up the whole of the society. It tells you so much. Just look at that building relative to the village and it already tells you something about the importance of those ideas in that society. Mythic culture extends to uh, things like, the, this is the coronation of, of Queen Elizabeth. Uh, you can see, if you look at that image, the, the costumes, the symbols, the, the maces, and the, 
the various gestures, uh, you're looking at the relationship between all of the different domains of society, the ecclesiastical, the military, the, uh, the, the government itself, various classes of people and so on. They're all spelled out. And here, uh, 30 years later, 40 years later, the same person uh, going through the streets of London and again, uh, the art, the, uh, all around you, including the art of the ritual itself, communicates a great deal about the social structure. So in mythic culture, unfortunately, is not always positive. That is, there's a great deal of, of conformity imposed by ideas and symbols and rituals in this way. And so it can take forms that are uh, also menacing and, and threatening. The point is there's enormous power in this whole huge social structure that we've built of skill and symbolism and meaning and story. Um, I, just a little parenthetic comment. It affects architecture. This is the front entrance to uh, of the most famous opera house in the world, La Fenice in Venice. And uh, when it was first built, uh, the architect left some notes. And it was burned down a few years ago and rebuilt, and they discovered the notes. And uh, it turns out that he had a very mythic idea about this theater. The entrance is, is Apollonian, that it's very severe, very analytic, very dry, whereas the interior of the theater is Bacchanalian or Dionysian, that is, it's about celebration and about uh, luxury and about sensuality and so on, so that the inside is a very different atmosphere from the Apollonian rational outside. And that was very deliberate on his part. Modern architects don't tend to think that way, uh, but it's interesting how that attitude uh, can determine a great deal about the environment. Now, where does technology come in? Well, technology has always been important. You couldn't have done the cave paintings without the right technology. You had to have the oil lamps. You had to have the pigments and ways of creating these things. But more importantly, and after I thought about this as a cognitive scientist for a long time, I realized that the thing about technology is that it creates memory media that are not in the brain. So this is a radical, radical development. It's not a small change. And I think I've proposed that it's as important as the biological changes that gave us language and mimetic skill in the first place. Uh, externalization of memory consists of many things. It doesn't just include writing. It includes all of the uh, symbolism and, and storage devices that we build in society that remind us of who we are and allow us to uh, collect information that goes across generations and across space and time. Um, I've used the word exogram to describe this so that the brain, a memory in the brain, as Carl Lashley proposed many years ago, could be called an engram. Okay, so when you have a memory and you carry it in your brain, that's an engram. A memory in any other medium is an exogram. So uh, a memory record that is outside the brain such as it might be contained in the encyclopedia, for example, or in a library or in a museum, is, is an exographic record. And it radically, radically changes the structure of the cognitive system because it allows human beings to create memories that are much larger, much more easily retrievable, that are more easy to reformat, and that can be shared and that are cut across space and time in a way that our poor biological memories cannot possibly achieve. So at that explains a lot about the power of literate societies and scientifically literate societies relative to the power of societies that are just in the Stone Age. It's not that the Stone Age people are necessarily any less intelligent, but without graphic storage, their, their options are extremely limited. There are, there are things that simply can't be thought. And if you don't believe me, think of mathematical symbolism. Try to think algebra using Roman numerals. Just try to do addition with Roman numerals. You know, it's very difficult. Um, breakthroughs in mathematics uh, allowed us to think thoughts that were not possible without those notations. So it's not a trivial thing I'm talking about. Exographic representation uh, includes uh, geometric and, uh, for example, Stonehenge uh, ritual stones that uh, are essentially astrological or astronomical clocks and computers. It includes maps and various types of diagrams that allow us to visualize and imagine things and structures that don't exist. So it's not just art I'm talking about. I'm talking about the power of the symbol to restructure thought, to restructure reality, and the virtual reality that we live in, in our heads, which is so important. Um, and one of the effects of this that is often missed by people is that when you invent new technology of that sort, you actually 
put demands on people to understand the technology and literacy, which our children have from a very young age, actually does restructure the brain. This, is, this diagram, which I don't have time to dwell on, is a very standard diagram in neuropsychology. It's a field which includes the study of things like acquired dyslexia, dyslexias that result from uh, brain injuries of various kinds. And uh, those uh, uh, types of patients can break down in different ways so that language is intact, speech is perfectly intact. They understand language, they speak, but they can't read anymore. And sometimes they can read certain things, but not other things. And what it reveals is a structure of little, shown by these little boxes, of real neurological centers in the brain dedicated to literacy skills that simply don't exist in a preliterate culture. So you have people that may be genetically identical, but their brains are wired up differently because they grew up in a literate culture. So this is a really big deal because if you invent new technologies and you adopt it into, into culture, you're actually, in a, in a serious way, reorganizing the way people's brains are organized and the way children are programmed, as it were, or, uh, as, they, as they go older. And this results in real structural change in the way the brain is organized. Although, the, of course, the genetic uh, anatomy is a given. We're talking about the functional neuroanatomy. Well, one of the results of, of all of this change, which has come so rapidly, is that we've evolved a new kind of culture, which has taken several thousand years, but within the last 200 years has become dominant. And I call it theoretic culture. Now, you go back over the story. We have mythic culture, which is gesticulatory, it's theatrical, it's, it's expressive, the whole body. Then you have mythic culture, which is about stories and about versions of reality. It's also about gossip, about tracking social relationships. And then you have theoretic culture, which is so different. And, and is characterized by modern government, modern corporations, science, um, and I, I, as I put down here, theoretic culture has also invaded the arts and religion in a way that simply didn't exist several hundred years ago. Uh, in the case of theoretic culture, for example, if you compare it with the architecture I just talked about in La Fenice, of, of futurist architects like Paolo Soleri and all sorts of uh, architects who fantasized and, and proposed various types of cities in the sky in the future. They're based on theoretical ideas. They're not based on mythic figures and so on. Um, these ideas are uh, um, embedded with ideas of social organization and social class and freedom and democracy and all sorts of other things. They're very abstract and yet they have an enormous determining effect on, on the way we plan our societies, the kinds of worlds we live in. The interesting thing about theoretic culture when it gets into art is that you get into a world where the, the meaning of a work of art is suddenly dictated by the theoretic uh, world that you're surrounded by rather than by commonly shared stories or myths or by uh, mimetic, uh, direct mimetic expressions. And the result is sometimes hard for people to understand. So for example, this is a cycladic head from Kiros, an island off Greece. It's, it's, it's about uh, 4,500 years old. And here's an, an image you know, by a sculpture, a very cutting edge sculpture in, in the United Kingdom uh, only 20 years ago. They look very similar, but the, the context in which they are constructed is totally different. In one case, uh, undoubtedly the head w w represents uh, a mythic figure, probably a god or something of that sort. Whereas in the other case, it's a comment, it's a very abstract comment on, on art itself and on form. Um, the result of new technology, such as the, the, the digital technology that we're talking about today, is that the world has restructured the cognitive system in which we operate. So it's not merely that people have to acquire all of these uh, kind of uh, literate skills that reorganize the way the, the, the short-term memory works, the way attention works, and so on in the, in the mind. It's also that the whole ecology changes. So what I have in this diagram here on the, on the lower part is, is indicated the global electronic information environment, which for all intents and purposes now is infinitely large and moving at, uh, at scary speeds. I did an article on the history of libraries and the accumulation of knowledge in, in human history. And the funny thing is that it moves fairly slowly by stops and starts over about 2,000 years, starting with the Remesium in Egypt, about 1500 BC, 
and various libraries, the Library of Alexander and so on. You go into the Middle Ages, the libraries are still pretty small. And uh, you get into the 18th century, they're up to a few hundred thousand volumes. You get into the 19th century, they're not much bigger. The 20th century, they start to take off. And by now, uh, with electronic technology, the amount of externally stored knowledge and information is virtually infinite. And that includes image banks that are virtually infinite. If you combine that with all of the advertising images, all of the logos and, and, and information that's flying around in the world, we're essentially in a world where uh, there's an, an unbelievable uh, a glut of, of images and information. So traditional external storage media are things like books and, and scientific instruments and so on. And these are all displayed in, in a field, the external memory field that's marked EXMF. Basically, you have to interact with all of this stuff as a single brain. You have to process this. And the challenge from my perspective is this. We have built this multi-layered culture and, and, and uh, uh, this uh, very complex world which has suddenly taken off to a size that makes it qualitatively more challenging to deal with than anything people had to deal with even a hundred years ago. Uh, one of the things that you have is that you carry all of these layers of culture and, and mental organization around in your brain in various ways. So you have very simple uh, episodic and mimetic representations expanded by linguistic representations, expanded by external representations. And we now live in a world where the external representations vastly outnumber anything you can carry around in your head. So where in, in, in a tribal society you might have had known most of the things that there were to know, uh, in our society, you can't know more, more than a tiny, tiny fraction of what there is to know. Um, and this puts a load on consciousness because consciousness can be seen as the sort of the interface between the neural matrix and the cultural matrix. The neural matrix is, is fairly slow moving. The brain can't move very fast. Our brains are, are moving in sidereal time by comparison with culture. Culture is, is spiraling along now with technology. And the result is that each of us is a, we can regard ourselves as little monads, you know, like it's this idea of little self-contained uh, uh, minds going around in space. And we hook up with memory in various ways. And this uh, uh, is our adventure. This is our situation. We sometimes share memory with others and sometimes we don't. This cognitive ecology affects art dramatically so that different forms of art have different origins. Some of them are mimetic, some are mythic. Some are theoretic. I would say that performance art and abstract painting, for example, are entirely theoretic constructions in their origins. Um, and you can see that in some of the art that of the last uh, century, uh, where cubism is purely theoretic, uh, really, uh, in its motive, a lot of uh, environmental mm -hmm. art and so on. And uh, genetic uh, digital art is interesting because it uses essentially evolution algorithms programs to evolve works of art uh, using various cr uh, criteria. It's an interesting idea. But digital art, what does it include? Well, in my book, it includes King Kong. You know, It includes uh, uh, all kinds of popular uh, 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 videos and, uh, and forms of expression, as well as more abstract kinds of art. Uh, anything that uses digital media, in other words, it's a, it's a very rich uh, and transformative type of technology that has opened up possibilities that we have never entertained before. So you can say about digital art that it's a product of high technology, but it's also a product of our deep evolutionary history. And the, the question, as always, is what is it going to say? Because ultimately, when we come back to our representational history, we find that we can't do without the mimetic. It's, that's the dimension in which we live most of the time. We can't do without the mythic. Everyone needs, uh, acquires their identity from from myths. So for example, uh, when children are young, they play at roles. They play at different uh, roles in society. And in a sense, the story of their own lives, their, their autobiographical memory, is a, is a mythic construction. So that your own idea of your own life is that of a, of a hero moving through space and time and, and having various adventures and so on. Uh, that's, a, that's a mythic construction. You can't do without it. Everybody has to have it. It's not a choice. Theoretic culture, on the other hand, is not a necessity. It's a purely cultural construct, and it's very technologically bound. And the question is, where is it going? 
Uh, now, all I want to do in telling you all these things is to give you context in which to think about, about art and especially about the exhibit that you're going to see uh, tonight because it's a, a very um, interesting, cutting-edge new adventure that we're going on. And uh, artists have always had a way of reflecting ourselves back to ourselves. Sometimes they've been impish and nasty. They've taken apart society. Other times they've transformed our lives and led us to new insights. And so uh, it's really a, an unknown at this point what all of this new technology is going to be used for. But when you walk into a museum, keep in mind that you're looking at, at layer upon layer of cultural history um, laid out in various ways by various artists. Now I'm just going to close with this image, which is the cover of my uh, most recent book, uh, A Mind So Rare. It's, it was a, an, a painting by a, a, an artist in California named Francois Podevin. And uh, what's interesting about it is the golden bird in the middle. If you look at the, at the head, it's emerging, it's emerging out of a kind of a, a murky looking swamp. So you can think of the human emerging out of the, out of the, the, the chaos of the past and looking to the future as well as looking to the past. But if you look inside the head, you find the universe inside the head is just as big as the universe outside the head. And what's interesting is that there's this golden bird in the middle. And the question is this, is that bird ascending uh, to higher levels? Or is it just about to do a plunge into the depths of hell? Uh, a question which uh, I often pose to myself. Thanks very much. Thank you.